The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent, tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed down low to the ground. He said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord. Do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way, now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered, do as you say. So Abraham hurried to the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get these siahs of fine flour and knead it and bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. Then he brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. While they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where is your wife Sarah? They asked him. There in the tent, he said. Then the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, you, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent which was behind them. Abraham and Sarah were already old and well advanced in years, and Sarah way past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my servant, my master is old, Will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed day next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh, but he said, yes, you did laugh. This is the word of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Just imagine that you're sitting in your living room or in your back porch or somewhere in the house, and you hear the bell ring, the doorbell, the front doorbell, ding dong. And the bell rings, and it really is saying, is anybody home? What do you do when someone is at your door and ringing that doorbell? If you're expecting a friend, you probably go right to the door quickly and open it and invite that person in. But what happens if you open the door and there stands a complete stranger? You're probably not so welcoming. You're probably not so accommodating. The reception we offer a friend or acquaintance is far different from that offered to a stranger. And the question comes then, and as we reflect on this story of Abraham and Sarah, what would you do if God was at your door? How would you receive him? Would you invite him in? Or would you slam the door shut and ran, ran away, ran away out the back? Because the fact is, God is at our door, each and every one of us. In the book of Revelation, Jesus says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. So what should we do? What should you do? What should I do as we consider God standing there at the door of our life and the door of our heart? I cannot get out of my head a picture I saw many years ago. It shows Jesus standing outside a closed door. It appears that he is just ready to knock. And at the bottom of this picture is the verse. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. And I think that door, I always have interpreted it as that door meaning life. Your life, my life the life of all people. But what is intriguing about that door, as you look at the picture, is that's a solid wooden door, 
but there is no doorknob and there is no latch. That door cannot be opened from the outside, only from the inside. You see, only you and I, only we can open the door, the door of our life and our hearts, and welcome Jesus inside. What did Abraham and Sarah do when God was at their door? The reading unfolds as Abraham is sitting in the doorway to his tent and it's a hot day. He's perhaps mulling over the events in his life in which God has appeared to him, that God has renewed his promise that Abraham would have a son even in his old age. Now God had already changed his name from Abram to Abraham which means exalted father, and Sarah had been changed from Sarai, and her new, word, her new name meant princess. And these names were to remind the couple that through them, through them, God would establish a great nation from kings and leaders, including the king of kings, the king of kings who would bring salvation. He would save the world from sin. Lost in perhaps those kinds of thoughts, Abraham did not at first notice those three men standing a little way off from his tent. They appeared to be strangers, and in those days a stranger would not approach another's tent unless invited. And so when he did notice those men standing there with the midday sun beating down on their heads, and I thought of this as I'm reading it again, it was probably a day like we've had these last few days, those hot, humid days. After all, they were out in the desert. And so he sees those men and goes out immediately to meet them. He bows to the ground and he says, if I have found favor in your, lie, in your eyes, my lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought and then you may wash your feet under and un rest for a while. Let me get you something to eat. You can be refreshed and then go on your way now that you have come to your servant. What a wonderful way Abraham greeted those, those three strangers. He had no idea who they were. He had no idea at all. And although he was rich and powerful, he had a special relationship with God, yet he did not think of himself as more important than they were. And so I think in his humility, he teaches us that our neighbor is someone to serve, not to take advantage of. He was the perfect host, and preparations began immediately to prepare a welcome feast. And the men eat silently as Abraham watches after all has been prepared. And he has a strange feeling in their presence. And when the, le the leader speaks about asking about Sarah, he realizes this is no stranger. This stranger is the one the one who had spoken to him a year before, but he had not seen him. This was the one who promised that Sarah would bear a son. This is the Lord. Then the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. What a wonderful promise. What a marvelous promise. And yet they could hardly believe it. In a large city high school, there was a study made of the two high school classes of history. Both classes studied the same material. They used the same workbook. They were taught by the same teacher, and they all did the same homework. They took te same tests, of course, including a final exam. There was a very big difference between those two classes, and that was this. The teacher told the students of the one class on the very first day that every single one of them would receive an A for the course. No matter how they did on their homework, no matter how they did on the final exam, they would get an A, every one of them. The other class was not told that. And what the researchers discovered surprised them Common sense would suggest to us that the students promised an A would choose to do very little during that semester, 
they would just sit back on their laurels. But they found the exact opposite to be true. That class, that class that was promised the A at the end of the road, did far better than the other class. The class who merely memorized information longer than the other class, or merely memorized it long enough to pass a test. While the students who were promised that A were free, they didn't have that thing hanging over their head what was going to happen. And they learned the material without the pressure of having, having really to prove it. Now that may be an imperfect illustration, but I think it does reveal something significant about us, our human nature. How often when we're forced to do something, then we are not really motivated in the proper way. It's rather fear of failure or rejection. And then if we know, if we're afraid of that, our actions really do not do much to change us. But when we do something because we choose to do it, when it comes from a response of gratitude, knowing the A was assured, there can be a transformation Force and fear make us miserable, and they are miserable motivators. But it's love and it's grace that can free us and can transform us. And I think that is the kind of work here in the story today, that kind of a dynamic. In the culture in which Abraham and Sarah lived, infertility, the lack of children, was believed to be God's punishment for sin. This couple lived under a cloud of fear and self-condemnation. But into that hopeless situation comes an outrageous promise, the promise of God. You will have a son. Not because they somehow earned it, not because they were especially good enough to deserve it, but it was given as a gift a gift, a free gift. And to believe it meant faith. The Abraham and Sarah story announces that God fulfills his promise, this promise, in spite of them. Adam is 100. Abraham is 100 and Sarah is 90 years old. The fact that two of them would be parents was absurd. And yet they're blessed. They're blessed because God is good all the time. And having been so blessed, they're set free to be a blessing to others. They had faith. They trusted God. And that's the good news. That's the good news we need to hold up over our life experiences. Because behaving or just following the rules for fear of punishment doesn't really change us at all. Nor does that express true love for Almighty God and Jesus Christ our Lord. Because in Him, in Jesus and through His cross, we have the promise of God. In that experience on a cross, God announces to you and to me, I love you, I forgive you. And we now know, not because we're good, but because we are forgiven by grace, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And all we do then, we should do out of gratitude. A joyful spirit led faith and obedience to all that God has already done in Jesus. In Christ we are forgiven we are loved, we are named, we are claimed, we are called, we're empowered, we are gifted, and we are commissioned, we are blessed beyond our, our reason and far beyond what we desire and deserve. We are blessed to be a blessing to others. And so when we know that in our hearts and in our lives, it's like opening the door to Jesus. And we can live boldly and worship joyfully 
and give generously and serve selfishly, selflessly and follow faithfully. Yes, the Lord is at the door. Let us be prepared to greet him and to serve him by opening the door to our life and our heart. Welcome him, the Lord, the Savior, Jesus, the Christ. Let us pray. Faithful God, we are thankful that we don't have to live in fear of your punishment. We don't have to behave in a certain way to earn your love. For you have given us Jesus. Jesus Christ who lived, died, and rose for us. And that is the good news that sets us free to live in a new way. Guide us to open the door to our lives and our hearts that we may love and serve you and our neighbor, whoever that may be. In Jesus' name, amen.